Thank you. Thank you, Tom, very much for inviting me to be here, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, Emmeline Hill is my name. I am the um, chairman and co-founder of um, Equinome, which is an Irish-based biotechnology company that has been developing and providing genetic tests for racing performance to the international um, thoroughbred racing and breeding industries for the last three years. The company was set up in 2009 in partnership with Jim Bolger, who is one of Ireland's um, uh, top trainers and has uh, uh, produced and bred um, uh, multiple European and uh, 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 champions. Um, so the company is based in, uh, in Ireland, but we have a, we have a global uh, market for um, our tests. And, and today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about genetics, what is genetics, um, the tests that we've developed, and most importantly, the research behind the tests and how these can be applied, how you as breeders might use this information to um, better inform the decisions that you make on a daily basis in regard to your mares, your stallions, and your, your young stock. All living organisms are made up of billions, trillions of cells, and inside Inside each cell, in the center, in the nucleus, is, that's the house for the genetic material. In the horse, the genetic material is packaged into 32 pairs of chromosomes, one of each pair coming from the sire and the dam. This complete complement of genetic material is known as the genome. A chromosome essentially is a long linear molecule of DNA. So this blue bar represents a chromosome and the letters um, within the blue bar represent the DNA. DNA is made up of the letters G, A, T, and C, which essentially represent the chemical bases that form the DNA. DNA is the genetic material that's passed down from generation to generation. So as breeders, it's this genetic information that we're most interested in, because this is the information that's passed from the siren dam to their progeny. The letters of the um, genetic alphabet, let's say, G, A, T, and C, can combine in various different ways within genes along the chromosome to, in, in unique ways to form the information for that gene. So um, each of these orange blocks represents a gene. There are about 25,000 genes in the horse genome, and each of these genes uh, provides the instructions to the cell to make a particular protein. It's this information found within the genes that we're most interested in. The combination of these letters within each gene is unique. In many cases, um, a single gene is responsible for um, a trait. One of the, I suppose, um, best examples is eye color. Okay, there's a single gene that determines the color of your eyes. But in most cases, multiple genes contribute to a trait. This is known as a complex trait, where many genes come together to combine um, and are also influenced by the environment. I don't know who Lee is. Um, we have known for quite some time that genes contribute to um, athletic ability. After all, what you do every day looking at the pedigrees is trying to determine the genes that may have been inherited from ancestors within that pedigree. So what you're trying to do every day when you're looking at pedigrees is to understand genes and understand genetics, the genes that have been passed down from one generation to the next. We also know from human studies, um, human scientific studies, that there are a large number of genes that have been shown to contribute to athletic performance traits, whether those are to do with uh, various different aspects of um, muscular performance, um, aerobic performance, and so on. So it stands to reason then that, there, that these genes may also, or there may be genes that are contributing to athletic performance within uh, the thoroughbred. The horse genome um, was sequenced at the um, Broad Institute um, in Boston in 2007. Um, we now know, these, these are actually pictures that I took of the warehouse where the, the sequence, so what I'm talking about is the sequence of the letters, the G-A-T-C combination of letters of the genetic code 
but then the horse. And as um, we were actually taking these pictures, the horse genome, the, the sequence of the letters for the horse genome was actually being churned out of these machines. So we now know the three billion letters of the genetic code for the thoroughbred. And it's my job to try to understand what all of this means. Um, to translate this information to um, the end user, um, I set up a company, um, Equinome, in partnership with Jim Bolger in 2009. And the idea was to um, provide um, uh, genetic tests that are founded in real, um, proven scientific research. Um, and to provide this to the end user so that you can maximize the genetic potential of each and every one of your horses. The first test that we launched in January of uh, 2010 um, is, the, is the speed gene test, what we call the speed gene test. Um, and the speed gene test can determine um, if an individual is best suited to short, middle, or longer distance racing. We published this um, in a um, top class scientific journal in um, January of 2010 at the same time that we launched the company. So one of the most important things in doing scientific research is publishing in the, in the public domain. This means that our research has been evaluated by other scientists within um, the field and demonstrated that it is um, true and, uh, uh, and real scientific research. We first started looking at one gene uh, that's called myostatin in, um, in the middle of uh, probably around 2005-2006. Uh, um, and the reason we started looking at this particular gene is because we knew that um, it was involved in the development of really unusual muscle char characteristics in a large number of species. So you can see here there's a Belgian blue. This is a Belgian blue bull. And he has what's known as double muscling trait. He has really unusual muscling. Um, and this is because he has inherited a mutation in his myostatin gene from his mother and from his father. So mutation essentially is a change in the letters of the DNA code within the myostatin gene. And he has got what, uh, one copy from his mother and one copy from his father. And this results in this particular characteristic. Believe it or not, the middle picture is a whippet dog. This dog is known as a bully whippet. And he has this really unusual muscling characteristic because he also has an inher inherited a mutation in the myostatin gene, one from his mother and one from his father. Now, this is actually detrimental to performance because his muscle, he has too much muscle bulk. Exactly. But dogs that have only one copy of the mutation inherited either from their mother or from their father are better racing dogs than dogs that have no copy of the mutation. So they have an, an intermediate muscle mass. And this um, picture on the right is um, uh, the child of an Olympic shot put athlete. And when this baby was born, the hospital staff noticed that it had really unusual muscling in its legs. So they looked at the DNA of this child and of the mother and they found that they both have mutations in the myostatin gene. So I asked myself when we had all of this information, not just in, in these species, but also in sheep, in pigs, in mice, um, but nobody had ever looked at it in horses. Um, and I had some background in the thoroughbred industry, um, and I started asking the question, well, if there are differences in all of these species, maybe there are differences in the myostatin gene within thoroughbreds that may separate the population out into different types. So we set about reading the DNA code within the myostatin gene. There are about 6,000 letters within the myostatin gene in thoroughbreds. And what we found, that at one particular position, one of the letters, it was a letter T in some chromosomes, was a letter C in other chromosomes. So remember, I said a chromosome is a long linear molecule of DNA, so this blue bar represents the chromosome. This is the myostatin gene, and at this particular position within the myostatin gene, there's the letter T. On other chromosomes, all of the letters are exactly the same, except at this particular position, instead of being a T, there's a C. Now, of course, 
all individuals have two copies of a gene, one inherited from the sire and one inherited from the dam. So if an individual inherits a C-type chromosome from the sire and a T-type chromosome from the dam, then their genetic type is known as CT. It's also CT if it's the other way around, if the C chromosome comes from the dam and the T chromosome comes from the sire. Now, if an individual inherits a T-type chromosome from both the sire and the dam, then their genetic type is TT. And if they inherit a C-type chromosome from the sire and a C-type chromosome from the dam, then their genetic type is CC. So there are three possible combinations of genetic types at the myostatin gene. An individual can be a CC type, a CT type, or a TT type. The first question we asked was, is there any difference in the frequency of the CC, CT, and TT types among group race performers when we compare a set of group race performers um, to a set of horses that had never won a race? And the answer was no. So essentially there were just as many, proportionally as many CC horses were group race performers as TT horses were group race performers. Okay. Uh, as, as CC, CT, and TT horses had proportionally the same number of group race performers uh, versus um, poor performers. But when we separated out the group race performers um, according to their best race distance, when we defined the best race distance as the distance of the highest grade of race that they had won, we found a highly statistically significant relationship between the best race distance and the genetic type. The three genetic types were very, very strongly associated with best race distance. The CCs were best suited to the short distance races, the CTs to the middle distance races, and the TTs to the long distance races. So we're looking here at um, a set of CC horses that had all won at group level. And if we look at the bottom here the, uh, for two, in two furlong increments, the majority of CC horses won their best race over distances of five and six furlongs. 98% of CC horses in our study set had won their best race over distances of up to and including a mile. And just 2% had won their best race over distances of greater than a mile. And this, in all of the replication studies that we've done, essentially this is um, uh, consistently replicated. But about 98% of CCs fall within the five to eight furlong uh, category, with the majority of them uh, at five and six furlongs. The CT horses, on the other hand, are more versatile in terms of the distances. These are the types of horses that can perform well over the shorter distances as two-year-olds and then can train on um, well over the um, middle to longer distances as three-year-olds and, uh, and older once those opportunities um, arise. So this is the type of horse that could be a, uh, a Guineas and a Derby horse. The TT horses, on the other hand, are at the other end of the distance spectrum. The majority of... TT horses have won their best race over eight furlongs uh, and above. In fact, 80% of TT horses won their best race over 10 furlongs and above. So you can see there's a very, very big difference between a TT horse and a CC horse, where 80% of TTs have won their best race over 10 furlongs and above, and 70% of CCs have won their best race over five and six furlongs. It's a huge difference. And this clearly has implications, um, not just for racing, but also um, for breeding. We have um, clients in all of the major bloodstock regions of the world, and um, depending on the, um, uh, the area in which they're operating, will depend on how this information can be applied. Um, many people are using it to make informed sales and selection decisions. So with this information in hand, we can do a test as soon as a foal is born, or as soon as you're happy to, to take a blood sample, and you then will know the genetic potential of that individual for the type of racing um, that it may be suited to. So you can use that information then to, to plan, to make a plan for that individual horse on the basis of its genetic information. Um, 
you can also identify those individuals that are going to be best suited to two-year-old racing because the distances for two-year-olds are limited. The CC and the CT types are more suited to those uh, distances, and I'll show you some data relating to that. Um, probably uh, most obviously for horses and trainings can be used to um, uh, train and race individuals for what they're genetically made to do rather than making assumptions of what they may or they should do on the basis of their pedigree um, or what they look like. So you can use it to optimize the training regime and obviously to fine tune the racing strategy for each individual horse. Um, many breeders are using this information to manage their mating decisions, to more consistently produce the type of racehorse that they want from their mares, either from individual mares or from their entire breeding operation. And I'm going to show you how that works. Um, stallion farms are now using the information to um, uh, promote their stallions on the basis of their uh, genetic types. We have farms in Australia that are advertising the genetic types of their stallions, to, uh, particularly for young stallions, because of course it takes um, five years from a t the time a, stallion goes to, a young stallion goes to stud to know exactly what it's going to produce, because you need the first crop of foals to have completed their, their three-year-old season to um, uh, uh, estimate a stamina index. So you can make a prediction about how the stallion is going to perform as a stallion with this information. Um, we did a, st a study where we looked at 142 two-year-olds that were in training with the same trainer in 2007-2008. This is uh, Jim Bolger's set of sets of two-year-olds in 2007 and 2008. And we asked the question, does their genetic type, the CCCT and TT type, have an influence on how they perform as two-year-olds? And the answer is clearly yes. If you look along uh, the chart, there are about 40 CCs, 67 CTs, and 35 TTs. And probably uh, the most important is the bottom line at the end of the day when you're um, racing horses. Um, the CC and the CT types, on average, earned four times more in earnings than the TT types. Something that struck me, though, when we did this, I thought, oh, gosh, what if there's a stallion that may be influencing the CC and the CT types that might be a better stallion? So we took a subset of these that were all by the same sire. So we're eliminating the um, sire influence. They're all by the same stallion. They all came into the trainer's yard um, with the trainer's same expectations uh, of them. All of the horses were CT or TT horses. This tells us something about the stallion. The stallion must be a TT horse because he hasn't produced any CC foals. I'll show you how that works as well in a little while. But look at the difference in the bottom line in two-year-olds. They're all by the same stallion, all in the same training environment, all given the same opportunities. And the difference in how they performed as two-year-olds <coughs> is due to their genetic makeup. Now, this is not to say that the TT horses didn't go on and perform well as three-year-olds and above when the distances became appropriate for them and suitable for them. So TT horses can be are exceptional horses. Some of the best horses in the world are TT horses, but they are just not suited for two-year-old racing or as suited for two-year-old racing as CC and CT horses. Now, some may argue that, well, of course, you can tell this from the pedigree. Um, anyway, you can tell the, the um, distance aptitude for a horse from its pedigree, um, or by looking at the individual, um, or the two combined. Um, what I'm going to show you is that full siblings with exactly the same pedigree page can be very different genetically. And also, by um, measuring uh, yearlings is not always a true indicator of how they're going to develop um, once the training influence um, uh, is established, but the more accurate predictor is the genetics. So first of all, the, the um, confirmation types. We have been collaborating quite closely with a, a group in Japan, um, and they did a study on um, height to weight ratios in a set of almost 100 Japanese um, yearlings and followed these measurements. So that essentially, that's an indicator, proxy indicator of muscle mass. Um, they followed the yearlings then as they went into training and through the first couple of months of their two-year-old um, training season. The top blue line are the uh, CC colts. And if you look then at the um, yellow line with the, uh, with the squares, those are the 
TT coats. Now, when they were at the uh, yearling sales stage, there was no significant difference in the measured, uh, there was no significant difference in the measurements between the CC <coughs> and the TT horses. But as the training um, stimulus, as they entered into training, the training stimulus altered the muscle type, allowed the CC horses to uh, more rapidly develop a more rapidly developed muscle. And this makes sense then in terms of what's asked of those types of horses and how those types of horses perform. Now, I think what the interesting thing is that, okay, it's all very well. In hindsight, you can't, the stars represent statistical significance. So once they are in training, you could, in fact, measure these horses physically and um, with some level of statistical accuracy determine what type it is. And you all know this by looking at an individual, whether it looks like a, a stare or if it looks like a sprinter. But importantly, imagine if you extrapolate those, these lines back to when they're foals. If you look at a foal, you can't tell how it's going to develop. But if you do a genetic test, you can make a prediction of how it's going to develop when it gets to the two-year-old training stage. In terms of pedigree, full siblings that have identical pedigree pages genetically can be very different. So if we have a CT stallion and we take a CT mare to that CT stallion, that combination can potentially produce <coughs> all three different types. If the mare passes her C chromosome to the foal and the stallion passes his C chromosome to the foal, then one in four foals will be the CC type. If the mare passes her T chromosome and the stallion passes his C chromosome, it's a CT foal. If the mare passes her C chromosome and it combines with a T chromosome from the stallion, it's a CT. And if they both pass on their, TT their T chromosomes, then it's a TT foal. So one in four foals from this mating will be CC types. Half of them will be CT types and one in four will be TT types. These are all full siblings. They have identical pedigree pages. So you can't accurately predict the type of racehorse from just looking at the pedigree. You can use this information then to manage your matings to more consistently produce the type of racehorse that you want. So if you have a CC mare and you want to um, maximize the um, number of um, CC and CT foals and eliminate the possibility of producing a TT stallion then, or sorry, a TT foal, then if you send your CC mare to a CT stallion, 50% of the time you'll get a CC foal, 50% of the time you'll get a CT foal. And in this combination you will never get a TT foal. Works the other way around. If you only want to have TT horses, then you know which way to go. Some may um, argue that, um, well, you can tell this from the pedigree, there's a very stamina-oriented dam line. But I, this, I think, clearly demonstrates that within two generations, you can go from a very stamina-oriented um, uh, half of the pedigree to very quickly to um, a, a horse that's suited or better suited for sprint-type racing. So if this uh, TT... Um, great grandsire and uh, CT produces CT. This mating can produce a CT, and you're going to perhaps that's a middle distance horse. I think this is a middle distance stamina type horse. They can still produce a CC foal. So even looking back in the pedigree, it's not always possible to determine what you're going to get. So you can use this to manage your matings if you want to produce or more consistently produce horses at um, the sort of the speed end of the spectrum, you can use these combinations. If you want to more consistently produce more at the stamina end of the spectrum, then you can use these matings down here. Very quickly, <coughs> using this information, you can change the makeup of your um, uh, of your full crop. Um, Jim Bolger started using this information to inform his breeding decisions in. Uh, 2010. So the first foals that were born using this information were born in uh, 2011. The blue are the CC types, the proportion of CC types in the foal crop. 
The red are the proportion of CT types, and the green is the proportion of TT types. Now, he determined that he would get a quicker return on his investment if he produced fewer TT types. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with a TT type, but this is the model that he is operating under. So, if he could produce fewer TT types, he'd have a better return on his investments as they um, will, I suppose, perform better as two-year-olds. Um, these are the proportions that he had uh, in his fall crops prior to using the genetic information to inform his matings. And within a single season, he went from having 16% of his fall crop as TT horses down to less than 5%. And this year, uh, there are only three, I think, three foals that were, are the uh, TT type, and not one of them is a colt. So he's delighted with that outcome. So very, very quickly, within a single season, using the information, you can rapidly um, and dramatically alter the genetic makeup of a population. Now this happens and has happened naturally over time and in different geographies because selection by um, breeders without the genetic information can also change this, but it just takes more time. So what we're doing is we're not actually doing anything differently, we're just accelerating the process by using this information, accelerating the processes that have been in place for two, three hundred years. We tested a set of stallions, um, sorry, the DNA that was extracted from um, the remains of 12 thoroughbred stallions that lived in the 1700s, including the horse Eclipse. And what we found is that all of these stallions were TT horses. This makes sense because the racing of the time was match racing over four mile distances. Often they were running multiple um, heats in a day, so they needed a huge amount of stamina. Then racing changed at the turn of the century, there was a, a greater emphasis on speed um, and shorter distance, shorter distance racing and also horses racing younger. They even went so far as to race yearlings and then that was um, banned. But what we have now is uh, a population of horses that um, has uh, required elements of speed. In Europe we see this um, a nice balance between speed and stamina. 25% um, of horses in Europe are the CC type, 50% of the CT type, and 25% of the TT type. If we go to a different region where the emphasis is more on <coughs> speedy types and early, earlier um, racing types in Australia, we see a much lower proportion of TT types. So this has happened naturally by people naturally selecting for the types, and all, all this information could do is to speed up that um, speed up that process. Um, the distribution of types in Australia um, looks very similar to the distribution of uh, within uh, European sprinters. So essentially, um, uh, Australia has a population of, of, of sprinters and that's really what they're trying to do. Whereas in Europe, the population of stayers looks like this, with very, very few CC horses. Um, a crucial element to um, scientific studies is to be able to independently replicate your findings um, and, and validate them. So in collaboration with a group in Japan, um, we published, we've published two or three other papers um, that have shown in uh, very, very different sets of um, thoroughbreds that this um, pans out all the time. CC horses are better suited to the short distances, CTs to the middle distances, and TTs to the long distances. The dis differences between the colts and the fillies is the dis difference in the opportunities to race over those distances and as is a consequence of the race pattern. So the speed gene test can determine um, the individual's potential for short, middle, um, and long distance racing. And it's based on um, the information at a single gene, which is remarkable, really, um, because many, many genes contribute to ability. We all know that you need to have, um, in terms of the, the physiological requirements for racing, um, uh, you need to have the optimal combination of genes for um, uh, cellular metabolism. Um, for uh, the, the anatomical requirements um, and various different aspects of physiology. And we have always suspected that many, many genes contribute to racing performance. 
So it, last year we launched what we call the um, Elite Performance Test, which evaluates large numbers of genes that ha we have shown are critical to um, performing at the very top level. The way we did this is that we were able to evaluate um, nearly 60,000 of these letters across the genome at a single time. So 60,000 of the G, A, T, and C letters. Instead of just looking at one gene, now we can look at 25,000 genes. This is because of the rapid development of the technologies over the last couple of years. So by evaluating all of the genes in the genome, we were able to ask the question, what are the genes that um, separate out the elite performers, the group race performers, from the poor performers. And if we can build a picture of what the, a genetic profile for an elite racehorse looks like, then if we take an unknown, we can see how closely it matches to the elite population, or how closely it matches to the poor performing population. And that could give us a, a, an indication of how um, likely that horse um, may perform at the top level. Importantly, there will be different genes for sprinters and for stayers, because there are very different physiological um, and metabolic requirements for sprinters um, as for stayers. So the very first thing that we do is we determine if an individual horse is a CC, a CT, or a TT horse, and then we, that will help us to determine which genes we look at, whether we're looking at sprinting type genes or whether we're looking at um, uh, staying genes. So you can see here um, that many of the genes involved in um, uh, that are critical for elite race performance um, in staying horses are involved in aerobic respiration. Um, and then you can see some of the sprinting genes involved in lactate metabolism and so on. And this makes sense in terms of the known physiology. Um, so when we, uh, we evaluate large numbers of these genes in each of the, um, each of the panels and then um, provide a, um, a, a score uh, for that individual. Of course, it's not all genetics. Genetics contributes to a certain proportion of the variation in racing performance. Um, you need, of course, to start with the best possible chance. Success depends on inheriting the optimal combination of um, these DNA or genetic variants, but also a favorable environment is absolutely critical. And scientific studies have shown that genetics contributes to about 50% of um, the variation in racing performance. The other 50% is down to the management and training and the art of horsemanship that everybody here, that you're all involved in. So we can provide the information about the genetic potential of the horse, but of course, that's not everything. Once we've evaluated these various different um, panels of genes, um, we determine if uh, an individual is what we call a class one, a class two, a class three, or a class four. A class three horse has an average chance of being a group race performer. It doesn't mean that it's an average horse, it means that it has an average chance of being a group race performer. A class two horse has an above average chance of being a group race performer, and a class one has a very high above average chance of being a group race performer. The class fours have a below average chance of being a group race performer, and I suppose this is where um, the, the, the value of this sort of information um, may come in. We tested um, over 1,000 thoroughbreds, um, 250 or so of which were group race performers. When we looked at the entire population, this is the distribution of class ones, class twos, class threes, and class fours. So about 5% of the population are class 1s, 25% of the population are class 2, 47% of the population are class 3, and 23% of the population are class 4. So this is in the total population. Now if we look at just the group race performers, I'm going to show you how this distribution shifts. So this is 1,000 thoroughbreds, now I'm going to show you group race performers. You see that shift? So we've gone from 5% class 1 to 12% class 1s, from 20% um, class 2s to 40%, so we've doubled the number of class 2s, slightly reduced the proportion of class 3s, and massively reduced the class 4s. So just 4% of 
the elite population were class fours. That's compared to over 23% in the total population. So really, this is the distribution that everybody really is striving for. Heavy on the class ones and twos, and lower proportionally on the class fours. If we look just within the class ones, there was a very large proportion of the class ones were group race performers. So this is just class ones. Um, TBE, thoroughbred elite. These are the winners, proportion of class ones that were winners, proportion of class ones that were non-winners, and then proportion of class ones that um, were not raced. If we look now at the class twos, we can see that proportionally the um, uh, number of uh, group race performers or elite performers is slightly lower. Now, remember I said there were about 200, 250 were group race performers, so the average should be about 20%. 200 of 1,000, so this is a, you have above average chance of being a group race performer. The class threes have an average chance of being group race performers, but you can see here that the non-winners, proportion of non-winners is creeping up, and that's probably as important as trying to get a group race performer or produce a group race performer. And now you can see here among the class fours a very, very high proportion of non-winners compared to group race performers. Now, it's important that, uh, to note that this is the genetic potential only. As I said, um, we can evaluate the genetic potential of a horse, but the management and training and all of those other things come in. So it's obviously, it's not a guarantee, but it's helping you to weigh your chances in the right direction. Um, importantly, this as well, this is a population based on sort of a population uh, scale. So if... I had a population of class four horses, and one of you had a population of class two horses, then um, statistically, the population of class two horses will do better than the class four horses. Similarly, if I have a population of class three horses and somebody else has a population of class two horses, again, statistically, the class two population will do better. However, the individual class three horse may be able to outperform an individual class two horse. But on a population-wide scale, the more class ones and class twos you have, the better opportunity, the better strike rate you'll have. We have had class three horses, um, tested class three horses that are winners of um, Breeders' Cup races, um, some of the important um, Australian um, and international races, the Irish, UK and French Derby, um, Guineas, uh, and so on. So a class three horse doesn't mean that it's an average horse, but it has an average chance of... Uh, being a group race performer. Um, we have a, a presence in um, most of the um, uh, um, major bloodstock regions in the world. We've, um, we operate out of our labs in Ireland, so clients will send us in um, a sample from their horse, we'll run the genetic test and then send the results back to them. We have uh, recently opened an office in Australia to um, provide um, uh, support to our Australian uh, clients, which is one of our biggest markets outside of um, Ireland and uh, the UK. Um, some farms are advertising the um, genetic information for their stallions to promote their stallions and to ensure or to try to um, attract mares that are going to suit their stallions. And in that way, their stallions are going to do better and everybody wins. The mare owners will be able to select a stallion that best suits their mare, and equally, the stallion owner will have a better chance of, of uh, improving or the, the stock that that stallion uh, is going to produce. So this is Widdenstead, <coughs> one of the first farms in Australia to advertise the genetic type for the stallion. Many other farms have, have followed. So you can see here, um, Stratum is a CC horse. This means that this horse will never, ever produce a TT type foal. He will only ever produce a CC or a CT type. I think really um, we're just at the beginning um, of, re of really understanding um, what's going on at the genetic level. We have, I suppose, the, um, uh, we've used the state-of-the-art um, technologies as they arise. We have current ongoing 
um, research and development programs. Our products will improve um, and help us, I think, probably to understand more specifically uh, what's going on at, at the genetic level. Um, it's a never-ending story. There's always going to be research um, to be done, and we're not stopping, we're not standing still. Um, I do think that this is uh, a technology that is here to stay within the industry. We've had a massive uptake, a massive interest, um, and the people, I suppose, that are uh, becoming involved now, uh, learning about it, um, I suppose getting a handle on it for their own horses, will be better able to um, capitalize on any new developments as they, as they come along. Um, it is additional valuable scientific information that you can add to your toolkit. So it's, obviously it's not everything. Everybody uses various different ways to, um, to manage their stock and to, and to make decisions. Um, and this is never going to replace anything that you're doing and it certainly will never replace the art and the horsemanship um, that, that everybody has, but it's an, an additional information that you can't gain by just looking at the individual horse and looking at the pedigree. And just to thank the various uh, people who are involved in the company, Donald Ryan is managing director of the company, uh, and Jim Bolger, who's also director of the company. Thank you very much. Thank you.